If you are a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you want more money to fund your deals, regardless of what your banker or your broker or your hard money lender says, then you're at the right place. In just a moment, I'm going to plug you into the funding for your deals. So welcome to the show. I'm Jay Connor and the show here is Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm the Private Money Authority. And uh, if you are brand new to the show, well, we talk everything about real estate investing here, primarily single family houses, but we also talk about commercial as well. I got a very, very special guest and a very dear friend uh, on the show with me here today. But before I introduce him and bring him here on the show, I want to remind everybody and what I just mentioned when I started out a second ago, how am I going to plug you into the money? Well, our upcoming real estate investing cash flow conference is right around the corner. And at the conference, you'll be learning all four pillars of how we do the business, how we find deals before other real estate investors even know they exist, how you get your deals funded again, regardless of, you know, it has nothing to do with banks. All right. This is all about private money, got nothing to do with hard money lenders. In fact, at the live event upcoming, we'll have private lenders there at the event that you're going to be able to network with. Also, uh, we'll be uh, teaching or I'll be teaching uh, in person myself, how we sell any house in three days or less. And then of course, how we automate these pillars of the business. So you're running it and it's not running you. So you want to go over right now and check out on the website right here below my fingers, www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast, jayconner with an er.com forward slash money podcast. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll want to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future shows. And you can comment right below in the comment section with your questions. We get all of your real estate and uh, investing questions answered and, um, and, you know, give us a rating uh, there on iTunes, of course, subscribe, rate and review. We always appreciate your feedback. So with that, I'm so excited to have as my guest today, Alex Pardo. He's uh, his home base is out of Miami, Florida. And uh, Alex and I first got to know each other about a year ago. We're in the same uh, mastermind group and uh, he's a family guy. What I love about Alex is that he truly has a servant's heart. He's all about giving. He truly is a go giver. He's an entrepreneur, real estate investor, coach, adventurer, sports enthusiast. And as I just mentioned, he loves helping people. Well, he has, uh, we, we've got a lot in common. He's flipped uh, well over now 300 properties, probably knocking on 400 or so. I'll let him tell his own story in a moment. But the part of his story that I really like is uh, when he got out of college and university, uh, he went into the corporate world, went to work for GE, had a two year contract with him. Didn't take Alex very long to find out that after working uh, 75 hours a week, uh, he no longer had the dream of, you know, being the CEO of some fortune 500 company or whatever. He wanted to be in business for himself. So in December, 2005, he did his first real estate deal and he's been addicted to it ever since. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a family guy. His wife is Natalie. He's got two beautiful girls um, that I'll let him tell you about. Got Alexia and uh, Ariana. You're going to correct me yep, if I get that wrong in a second. And that's Alex. And Ariana. You got it, Jay. Excellent. So Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, I am excited, man. I've always told you, Jay, your energy is man. And it's, uh, you know, you're one of those guys. And uh, I just always keep in mind. I just, I love connecting with you. So I appreciate you having me on the show. Absolutely. I'm so glad for you to be here. And of course, uh, I've been on your show and you are the founder and the originator of Flip Empire show. So tell our viewers and listeners uh, what Flip Empire is all about and why they'd want to check out your show as well. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity, Jay. So yeah, I mean, the Flip Empire show is a podcast that I launched about two and a half years ago. And I love talking real estate. I love talking business, marketing, personal development. And I was having conversations with friends and mastermind members and family on a daily basis. And I said, you know, it would be pretty cool if I can record a lot of these conversations. So essentially, I kind of stumbled on the podcast platform, uh, didn't know anything about it. You know, I, I, uh, I learned a little bit about it, decided to launch one. And, you know, here we are about 260 episodes later, you've been on the show and uh, it was a very popular show, got great feedback. And so, yeah, essentially I publish two podcasts a week 
one where I interview an expert such as yourself. And then the other one is uh, a shorter show where I do a deep dive on one particular topic or question that an audience member submits. Um, and we cover everything from, you know, wholesaling real estate to marketing, lead gen, lead conversion, personal development, and, uh, you know, building a team sales. And, uh, and I love it. That's awesome. Well, I love your show. I love being a guest on it. And uh, as you said about me, I love your energy and I love your passion and I love your heart. So, um, so how did you, how did you get into, well, first of all, before we go to your backstory, go ahead and tell yeah. our viewers and listeners, you know, uh, about how many deals you've done and what kind of real estate deals you are doing these days. Yeah. So when I got started in 2005, my very first deal was a short sale. And uh, that deal took me about two months and I ended up making almost what I was making at my corporate job in GE. And uh, since then, Jay, I've done all types of deals. I think the only deals I haven't done are like new construction, new developments, things like that. But, you know, from seller financing to lease options, short sales, fix and flips and everything in between I've done. But really, my bread and butter has always been wholesaling. Um, and so about five years ago, I kind of got burned out with the business. I was tired of the one taking the calls from the marketing, meeting with sellers, sell, you know, signing the contracts. I, I was just tired of wearing all the hats. And so even though wholesaling is a transactional business, I wanted to create a small team around me to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And, uh, and really that's been the, the focus the last four or five years. And so, you know, now I have a business that I don't say is a hundred percent automated, but it's about 80% automated that kind of runs without me. Um, and it's because I've been able to find the right people, put them in the right seats to do a lot of the heavy lifting uh, within the wholesale business. And as far as number of deals, we've done somewhere around 400 deals. The truth is years ago, I stopped counting because it really doesn't matter. Right. Uh, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're not all cookie cutter, but a deal's a deal. And so, uh, you know, now it's interesting. I'm not really motivated by the money that the deal can generate, but it's, it's about fulfilling our purpose, which is helping people in South Florida uh, getting rid of unwanted properties, you know, and purchasing those properties. So that's really the drive. And don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a business. We do this to generate a profit, of course. Uh, but when you do so many of them at this point, it, it's just another deal. And it's like, how can you create a bigger impact uh, within the community and the people that you work with? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you, you know, not 100%, but maybe 80% automated the business. And I'm going to want to drill down on that uh, as, we, sure. as we get to the show. And by the way, let me tell all of our viewers and listeners uh, to stick around to the end of the show. Uh, we typically wrap up within about a half hour and the end of the show, um, you've got a, a free uh, course that you're going to offer folks uh, right at the end of the show, Alex. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah. So I created a, a five video course that essentially walks people through how I've been, uh, been able to wholesaling business. Um, and so the, the videos are very detailed. I got a mind map and it's the screen share. And so if you go to flipempire.com, you can just opt in. It's a hundred percent free, nothing for sale. Gotcha. That's wonderful. Thank you. So on the, uh, on the automation piece, um, I yeah. want to drill down on that in a moment, but before that, on average, how many uh, deals would you say you're doing a month now? You know, we're not doing a, a lot. We're, yeah, yeah, we're doing roughly three to four deals a month. Um, and that number is not impressive by any means. I mean, you and I know people that do 10 to 20 deals a month. What yeah. I think I'm, I may, we're able to hang, hang our hat on is this year, we've gotten really, really good at the data and the key performance indicators, the KPIs. And so last year, our average profit per transaction was about 19,000 and change. This year, it's just shy of 60,000 per deal. So even though we're not doing, you know, a, a large volume of deals, the deals we're doing are pretty good pops, uh, especially for wholesaling. Uh, really? And and part of that is, yeah, we've just, we've been able to really drill down and focus on the sellers that are most likely to sell, uh, you know, people that have some sort of distress. And, and we're also able to target properties that have a higher and better use. So for example, Jay, one of our, um, actually our biggest deal this year, we made just shy of 125 grand profit on a wholesale deal. It's we found we were targeting single family properties that were in a, a duplex or commercial, commercially zoned area. So we were able to contract those properties and essentially sell them to buyers that, uh, that wanted to redevelop. And, you know, those properties had a higher and better use. Well, you know, um, and I, I mean, you know, I, I, what I love, what I loved about talking with you, Alex is I've never wholesaled a house in my life. <laughs> 
I know, I know, I, 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 know, I, know I, I think I know how to do it, but I've never wholesaled one. Of course, you know, I'm in a real small market. Our total target market is only 40,000 people. And, um, but what's really different about you is your average wholesale uh, income that you make is like five or six times more per deal than the average. And so, um, how, how, how can that be or how is that? Yeah. So like I said, I, what we've done is we've gotten really good at identifying. First of all, um, we send out a lot of marketing and direct mail at niche list. So we target probates, we target inheritance. Um, and what we've gotten pretty good at is just analyzing the data. And so we, uh, matter of fact, at our last mastermind, that was what my presentation was about is we track up to 61 different data points everything from, you know, square footage, beds and baths, but we also target what's the homeowner's age, what's their occupation, around how much money do they make, what's their ethnicity. We take all this information of deals that we've closed in the last couple of years, and then we take this data and we use it in marketing to target the types of homeowners that are attracted to the offers that we're willing to make. Um, and so instead of having to mail, you know, 50, 100,000 postcards, like a lot of people that we both know is we're able to really drill that down and focus on kind of the 80, 20 rule, you know, the, the 20% of the sellers or people out there that are going to produce 80% of our results. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we target properties that have a higher and better use. And so we're able to command a premium for those properties. Um, I think the last thing we do is we'll close on the property and then relist it on the MLS. And that allows us to get a markup versus just selling it to like our wholesale list, if that makes sense. That's fantastic. So now are you saying that you're able to put it in the multiple listing service while you are controlling it, say with an option or uh, in other words, are you able to put it in the multiple listing service and sell it without having to fund the deal uh, before yeah. putting it in the multiple listing service? So no, we'll leverage private money. We'll actually close on the deal. So we own it. And then we put it on the multiple listing service, even though in our contract, we do have some verbiage that the seller is allowing us to place it on the MLS on their behalf. Um, and so we do have the ability to list it before owning it, but on some of our bigger deals that we've done, we've actually closed on it with private money and then put it right back out on the MLS. There you go. Now let's come around to the uh, automating and, and automation that you are so good at. Um, if I really pressed you, Alex, for you mm -hmm. to give, for you to give an accounting of really about how many hours a week you work in the business, what yeah. would you say? Yeah. So I work, I'm in the office by nine and I'm usually out of the office by three 30. Um, you know, and then I take lunch in the middle. So I probably put in Six hours a day, five to six hours a day, I would say is a fair number. I don't work weekends. Um, my family and I, we love to travel. And so I probably take a good month off every year. Um, not at one time, but spread throughout the course of the year. Uh, and yeah, you know, I have the ability to put in as many hours as I want or work as little hours as I, as I choose. And I think that's, that's the beauty of this business and just being an entrepreneur is that hopefully you're creating a business that supports the kind of lifestyle and, you know, fuels your passion, fuels the things that, that really make you tick. Um, and I think that's why a lot of us are in business. It, it's for the freedom. It's for the time. It's not so much the money, but it's what we feel the money can do for us. Absolutely. So, you know, you said that you're tracking like 61 different criteria points of, you know, your motivated sellers. But uh, if you would share with our viewers and listeners, you know, the business changes, right? I mean, what was working maybe a year and a half ago may not be working as well, whether it's a particular list or it's a particular marketing piece or it's a postcard or it's a letter or, or what have you. Um, but what are, your, what are some of your top favorite ways right now or strategies on finding motivated sellers? Yeah. So the first one is outbound calling. Um, about a year to year and a half ago, we, you know, stumbled upon this strategy. Uh, again, you and I both know several people that are pounding, you know, their chest about the results that they've gotten with outbound calling. Um, some of our biggest deals have resulted from outbound calling and the cost per lead with that marketing channel significantly less than what we're seeing with direct mail, which has always kind of been our bread and butter. But Jay, if I sit here and tell you that, you know, we get happy about a half a percent response rate from our direct mail. I wouldn't be lying. And that goes to show you like a year, year and a half ago, we used to see 
one and a half to two and a half percent response rate on direct mail. In our market, it's gotten so oversaturated that you know we'll send out if we send out thirty thousand postcards, we're expecting about a hundred to one hundred and fifty calls, wow. which is roughly about a half percent. So there's a lot of waste in that marketing, and that's part of the reason that we said, how do we wrap our arms around the data to focus on the sellers that are most likely to sell because they have a situation or a reason in their life that would cause them to sell at a deep discount. Uh, but outbound calling, direct mail, and believe it or not, we've we've done some deals this year from just referrals, you know, from reaching out to people that we've helped and closed deals with and said, hey, listen, we offer a $2,500 referral fee. Do you happen to know of somebody that has a house to sell or even an address of a vacant property that you've come across? If we buy it, you know, we're happy to uh, to compensate you. And you got to be very careful because there's laws around that. And so you have to be careful, you know, how you go about doing that. Uh, but asking that one question, you know, do you know of somebody or do you have another house to sell? Oftentimes can lead to additional leads that can, you know, uh, turn into deals. Yeah. So when you're outbound calling, um, do you have a team of uh, virtual assistants that make those outbound calls or have you hired a particular company to make the outbound calls? Yeah. So right now we have one dedicated part-time team member that she puts in 20 hours a week and she's just dedicated to outbound calling. She puts in roughly three to four hours a day. Uh, and then we did outsource and we hired it to, uh, so we were doing outbound calling in-house. And then we also hired a company that essentially employs a bunch of virtual assistants. And between you and I, like it, we just didn't see any results from those efforts. Uh, all the deals we've closed have been from the ones that, you know, uh, we did in-house essentially. Yeah. So this dedicated person, uh, are they, uh, are they dedicated to you and your company or they mm -hmm. do this for us? So, so they, they're just doing it for you yeah. and your company, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So actually it's kind of a, so this particular person we met through a sales training that uh, I put my team through about a year ago and we would listen to her role play calls with the sales trainer and she was fantastic and she was working for another company. And so, you know, I, we basically struck a, a friendship and I kept in contact with her and uh, it basically took about a year and we finally brought her on board. So she's still doing work for one other company. Uh, but yeah, essentially now she's, you know, she's doing some part-time work for us. And what's cool is that she loves being on the phone, talking to sellers like that juices her up. Uh, so it's kind of a perfect marriage. Yeah. So uh, does she use an auto dialer or does she like right. physically dial them? Auto dialer? No, mo yeah, we use Mojo Cells. Mojo? Um, yeah. You do got to be careful. I, I do want to say, obviously, I'm not an attorney or anything like that, but there are, you know, TCPA compliance laws. If you're going to be doing outbound calling that you have to be careful, I, I would consult with an attorney, uh, you know, because there are some rules and you just want to make sure that you're doing things on the up and up and you don't get yourself into any type of trouble. Yeah. Do you, good advice. Do you have a, uh, a service that uh, provides the uh, phone numbers for you or do you yeah. have, do you have to get the, do you have to like get a list from someone and then you go have another provider that gets the phone numbers for you? Yeah, no. So we, take our direct mail marketing. What I'm going to share with you is what works for us. Uh, be careful how you go about uh, using this information. And what I mean by that is you can uh, take a list and you can essentially get that list skip traced. Skip trace for people that might not know is, you know, you go out there and you, you find the contact information for these sellers. And so we'll get the list skip traced um, through a batching service. And then essentially we'll take that list and then you can go ahead and, you know, go to town as far as outbound dialing these people. Right. Yeah. One of my services uh, that I've heard a lot of good talk about over the years is uh, TLO. Uh, skip tracing. I don't know if you've used them yep. or not. Yeah, we have used TLO. Uh, Lexus Nexus is another one that is a, a really, really good service. Uh, and then I think uh, there's a, there's another service which I haven't used. I think it's called uh, Skip Genie. REI Skip Genie. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm, is that, is that what it's called? I haven't used them. Uh, what was the the second one you said? Uh, how do you spell Lexus Nexus? Yeah. So Lexus is L E X I S. And then uh, Nexus, N E X I S. Lexus, Lexus Nexus. That's another really, really good service. Yeah, I haven't tried them. So I know some of our viewers and listeners are wondering this right now on outbound calling, because this outbound calling thing, I really didn't start hearing about the popularity of it probably until about a year ago. 
uh, or so. And I mean, that doesn't mean people haven't been doing outbound calling for a long time, but at least, uh, at least, at least to where it's been coming into commonplace, if you will. So, right. um, so here's the, here's the question. Um, share with us for a moment. So, so your, your dedicated person dials up this number or the auto dollar dials it. Now somebody answers. Now right. these people, these people were not, this is sort of like a direct mail piece that they got in the mail. They weren't looking for it, but instead of a direct mail piece, it's a phone call. How does your person break the ice and yeah. like establish or attempt to establish rapport right away? Yeah, great question, Jay. So we've actually split tested different approaches. And what we have found works best for us is when you kind of act reluctant when they initially pick up the call and you almost kind of like fall on the sword, so to speak. And you, you know, you say, listen, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to bother you. My name is introduce yourself, let them know who you are right away. Um, and, and let them know, say, Hey, look, I don't even know if I have the right number, but I came across this property. I buy properties cash in the area. And I just wanted to see if by any chance you would be interested in receiving a cash offer. So we almost sound very reluctant, like, Hey, I'm so sorry to bother you. And we have found at least in our market that that approach will tend to open the door more often than if you try to go with a more direct approach or so we're kind of like the reluctant person on the other end of the phone. Like, Hey, you know, I'm not even sure if I have the right person. Sorry to bother you. That kind of approach for us seems to work better. I love it. I love it. So you're not coming across uh, like a bull in a china closet. Uh, you're not coming across aggressive. Uh, you're not I coming across uh, salesy, if you will. At all. Yeah, I like the that. Yeah, the complete opposite. And again, we've split tested and tried different approaches. For us, we've gotten more success with people being willing because we're not trying to buy the property on that phone call. We just want to like get the people to raise their hand and say, yeah, I have real estate I would consider selling. And then all we're trying to do is get them engaged in dialogue and conversation. That's all we're trying to do at that point. I got you. I got you. How many people on average would you say your person has to actually talk to on the phone for a, uh, for to, to convert into a deal? Every 60 dials that we make, we typically connect with about 13, 14 people. And out of those 13, 14 people, we'll usually get one to two leads out of that. I got you. So, yeah. And using a dialer, we typically get through about 60 people in an hour. So essentially, on average, we're seeing one lead per hour on the dialer. Wow. Okay. That's good information. Good information. Um, now you mentioned at the beginning of the show, your bread and butter is, is the wholesaling. So mm -hmm. different wholesalers have got different definitions of what actually okay. a wholesale deal looks like. So okay. if you could uh, take a moment and, and uh, share, what does your average wholesale deal look like as far as, okay, uh, so we're to the point of, okay, we've got a, mo we've got a motivated seller. We've got a lead sheet. What happens next all the way to the end of the deal, step-by-step? Step? Okay. So as far as what a deal looks like, it's interesting because you and I both get emails from, well, at least we do. We get emails from a ton of wholesalers and you know, they're marketing the after repaired value as 200,000 and they're asking 160. Not exactly a wholesale deal. Having said that, we have found that when we focus on nice parts of town, you know, be consider, we're able to command a premium on a wholesale deal. So for example, if a house is worth $200,000 and it's in a nice part of town in today's market, that's how crazy hot our market is. We can wholesale that deal for 150,000. To most people, they would look at that margin. There, there's not much margin there. You know, when you factor during closing cost, realtor commission, like how does that person really make money? And so we try to not get too hung up, Jay, on, you know, what's called like the Mayo formula. What's your maximum allowable offer? And you take the ARV and you multiply it times 70% or we try not to get too hung up on that. We just really, we know our market very well. And so we know if it's in this particular zip code, this part of town around, this is what our buyers will pay. So one way that, that your listeners can figure out what they need to be wholesaling properties for is figure out what cash buyers are paying for houses in a particular zip code. Um, I actually have a video on my site where it, it's about a 10 minute video. It walks them through how they can leverage list source 
to figure out where all the cash buyers are buying in different zip codes in your part of town. And so whenever we lock up a property, we know, by the way, we'll, we prefer to swing for the fences. So even if a deal is marginal, Jay, but it's in a good part of town, we'll put it under contract and we'll let the seller know that, hey, listen, we have an inspection period. We'll let you know within a three to a five day period if we're going to be moving forward on this. And we'll put it out to our list. Oftentimes, we've been able to sell properties that we were like, eh, this is kind of like iffy. It's 50-50. And in the past, we probably would have passed on that deal. But because we know the market is hot and people are still aggressively buying, we'll contract the property. We'll take a shot. And out of every 10 deals that we do that on, we'll probably move five or six of them that we didn't think we would have moved. So, wow. um, yeah. So we, we've loosened up our qualifying on the front end. You know, before we used to only go on appointments if we heard motivation. In other words, if the seller was distressed, then we would schedule an appointment. Now, because of the way our market is, if the seller has a house they want to sell, we'll schedule that appointment because we trust our sales process and we trust my acquisition manager's ability to get face to face, build rapport and uncover motivation by taking them through a sales process. Yeah. You know, you're saying, uh, you know, if they got a house for sale, you're, you're setting the appointment that triggers yeah. in, in my mind to share this. And, and you probably have the same experience. It still amazes me today, the number of lead sheets that uh, we get. And so my acquisitionist has talked to a seller and uh -huh. has told my acquisitionist, well, I'll, I'll just share a quick story. So yeah. and I, know you got a, I got a ton of the same stories probably. But as recent as uh, last week, so the uh, the after repaired value on this house is like one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. It might need fifteen thousand in, in repairs, maybe ten thousand. And okay. the seller told my acquisitionist he's not going a penny less than one hundred and fifteen thousand. He started at one hundred and twenty. She got him down to one hundred and fifteen, and not going a penny less. Okay. And so, so I told my acquisition, I said, get back with him and said, I'll go 100,000. And, and that's my final offer. So he tells her, nope, I'm sticking to 115. I said, okay, great. Two hours goes by. He calls her back and he says, okay, I'll go 105. I tell my acquisitions, tell him I'm still at a hundred. So, four days go by and now we're, we are under contract for a hundred, but here's the point of my story. And, and you give me your take on it. I've discovered, I've discovered that sellers of properties have no idea what their bottom dollar is until you make the offer, until you make the offer. So I I say, if you want the property, make an offer. I, I, I've never bought any properties that I didn't make an offer on. You know, what's your take on that? Alex? I completely agree with you, Jay. And it's one of the most important questions I think people listening can ask the sellers is, you know, what made you look into wanting to sell the property? Because you, you need to uncover, you need to find out what's the reason why. And don't be so quick to accept the surface level answer, but ask, you know, thought provoking questions. Like you got to dig and probe until you ultimately get down to why this person is even taking the time to meet with you. And, but yeah, you're hundred percent right. You can't buy a property in which you don't make an offer on. So absolute worst case scenario, make an offer on the property. You know what I mean? And then sometimes, you know, people will ask me, well, Hey, what if you can't get, cause I would always rather a seller give me their asking price versus me just volunteer my offer. Cause what if I offer more than what they'd be willing to accept? Um, one way that we have found if we just, one of the things we'll do is we'll ask sellers, Hey, you know, have you, what, what have you seen properties in your area sell for? So I'm not directly asking them, what do you want for your property? But I'm asking, what have you seen properties in the area? And so they'll, they'll typically throw out a number and say, Oh, well, were you expecting around that for your property? You know, a little more, a little less, get an idea, you know, try to poke and probe and find out what they want. But there's some sellers that just, just won't give you a number, Jay. One of the things we've done is we'll throw out a really, really big range. So like, let's say the after repaired value on a property is 200,000. We'll say, Mr. Seller, would it surprise you to know that we've bought properties in this particular area between 70 and 120,000? You know, so we'll just give them a, we're not giving them an offer, but we're giving them a range. And sometimes they'll, oh, there, there's no way I would sell for that. And then at least now you, you kind of have an idea where they're at and you can go from there. So, mm -hmm. you know, just don't want to give you a number, try throwing out a really, really big range, see how they react and then go from there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, 
so Alex, uh, you're very successful. You're driven, you're passionate. Uh, what would you say is one or more than one of your, do you, do you have any uh, daily routines or daily rituals or personal habits uh, that you do on a regular basis that you would say really lend themselves towards, you know, you actually living the dream? Yeah, absolutely. And I've experimented a lot with morning rituals. You know, like one of the things I'm really passionate about is personal development. I truly believe this was instilled in me years ago from a coach and a mentor is you're your biggest asset. So the biggest investment you can ever make is not in a property. It's not in a business. It's in yourself. And so I'm pretty religious about reading on a daily basis. And I'll be honest, sometimes I go through ebbs and flows where I don't do it as consistently as I probably should, or as I'd like to. But for the most part, you know, every morning I'm, I'm kind of an early riser. I'm typically up sometime between 4.30 and 5.30. Um, I feel better when I get a workout in the morning, but even before I get to that point, I use an app called headspace and I will meditate for 10 minutes and that I feel like it just, I'm able to collect my thoughts. I'm able to center myself. Um, and it's a fantastic app. It's a guided meditation. So I usually put in 10 minutes in the morning of meditation. I work out for about 45 minutes to 60 minutes. And then I spend some time reading, whether it's reading the Bible or reading a book on personal development, uh, business. I usually don't read too many real estate related books because they're, they're just techniques and stuff. I'm reading more about marketing, sales. Those are the types of, you know, the things that I like to read on because I feel it can move the needle in the business. Uh, but yeah, I have a very pretty strict routine. You know, the, the night before I always set my to-do list. It's always three to five things that if I accomplish that and nothing else for that day, I'd feel good about myself. And something I learned from Brian Tracy is eating the frog in the morning. Have you ever heard of that? Absolutely. But tell our viewers and listeners about it. Yeah. So in a, Brian Tracy does a much better job of explaining it, but look at your to-do list or look at the thing that you know is going to have the biggest impact on your life and in your business. The thing that you're probably procrastinating on, do that thing first thing in the morning, like eat the frog. And then once you've gotten through that, the rest of the day is just so much easier. You, you feel better about yourself. You gain confidence and it's just a momentum builder. Yeah. My dad taught me uh, years ago um, and this was way before Eat the Frog came out. He says, Jay, do what you are dreading the most first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And you know what, Jay, the faster you can do that, the more time you, you allow yourself to think about it, the more opportunity you have to not do that. So just react, just do it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what's the, uh, well now speaking of, of books, eat the frog, what's a book that you're now reading or you've recently read that's really, uh, had an impact on you. Here, let me, uh, let me show you actually. I am in the middle of this book. Can you see that? Yeah. Profit first. Fantastic book. So I'm about halfway done, but uh, have you heard about it or read this book? I have not heard about it. Phenomenal book. It essentially talks about, in a nutshell, about paying yourself first. And there's a lot of books that have talked about this concept. Uh, George Klassen, The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, oh, yes. Th that's a great book about essentially paying yourself first. But this book is about the fact that a lot of entrepreneurs are in business. And even though they might generate a revenue, they don't generate a profit. And this is about, you know, setting up different accounts to pay yourself first, not pay yourself last. Uh, and it, obviously it goes into a lot more detail, but that's just a super, super quick synopsis of that book. So. And uh, who's it by? Profit first by who? Mike, he's the same author of The Pumpkin Plan. Mike, and then for those that are not looking on uh, YouTube, I'll spell the last name. M-I-C-H-A-L-O. W I C Z. So it's Mike and then last name M I C H A L O W I C Z profit first. Awesome. Thank you for sharing yeah. that, uh, Alex. Well, Alex, we're about ready to wrap up the show here. Uh, I got another question for you though. And that is uh, what's the best advice you can give for a new real estate investor that has not done their first deal yet? So specifically for somebody that hasn't done their first deal is, um, get a coach or a mentor. And I realize that's not very sexy advice. You know, you've probably heard that numerous times, but 
you know, I did pretty well getting out of the gates, but I also made a lot of mistakes and incurred a lot of brain damage in the process that I could have avoided if I just would have invested in myself and paid for a coach or a mentor. Um, and, and back to your point, do the thing you know you need to do. You know, a lot of people have fear with picking up the phone, meeting with sellers, making an offer. You can't get good at this business unless you go out there and do it. So stop learning about it for now and start doing it because a lot of the education is going to come from the experience that you gain in doing it. Um, and I'm not saying not to educate yourself because that's been a, a big part of, I think, my life and my success. But at some point, you have to press pause on that video or put down that book and actually go do it. You know, so it, it that would be very simple, practical advice if I was speaking directly to somebody who's never done a deal and wants to get into this business. Well, I'd say it's not only simple and practical, but it's also very, very wise advice. Uh, I mean, like you, Alex, I started out, I did my first deal and uh, all I had done was read three books. Not a good way to start. So yeah, I, uh, I, I endorse what you just said. Get the mentor or coach. Alex, my lands, it is, I can't believe the time has flown by. We typically go about 30. I think we could have been about 40 minutes, but one more time, Alex, tell how people, uh, how our viewers and listeners can connect with you uh, on your show. Yeah, absolutely. So you can just go to empire.com, just how it sounds, or uh, an iTunes SoundCloud Stitcher. If you just type in uh, the Flip Empire Show, you can connect with me there. We, uh, we publish two podcast episodes a week absolutely nothing for sale. We keep it short and sweet between 10 minutes and half an hour. And it's uh, it's hundred percent content just based on, you know, our business, my life, my experience and, and what I think can help you in, in your life and business. That's great. Thank you so much, Alex. And tell uh, everybody one more time where they can get the, uh, the free course that you're offering. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Flipempire.com. A pop-up box will show up. You can just input your email and the, uh, the course will be emailed to you over the course of, I think a week to two weeks. It's a five video training course. That's great. All right, folks, there you have it. My friend, entrepreneur, family man, God fearing man, Alex Pardo. Alex, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Same here. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in here to uh, this episode. Appreciate you tuning in. And uh, of course, again, if you haven't subscribed yet, be sure and subscribe, rate and review us. Glad to have you here on the show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Uh, being a part of your life, I appreciate and helping you take your business to the next level. Bye for now.